This conference will now be recorded. Good evening and welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting of August 2nd, 2021. Call the order, please. Councilwoman Huss? Here. Mayor Potan Johnson? Here. Councilman Mitchell? Here. Councilman Noack? Here. And Mayor Walbrook? Here. Here. Okay. Um, approval of the minutes. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, approval of the agenda. I think we approve the agenda as printed. Second. Councilwoman Huss? Yeah. Mayor Potem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. And Mayor Wong? Yeah. Hi. Motion carried. Any other modifications to the agenda this evening? All right, now approval of the minutes for regular and closed sessions of July 19th, 2021. Any issues or changes? Okay, citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your concerns. This is the only time during tonight's council meeting that the public is allowed to address council. If you'd like to do so and you're live here in the room, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. And then I'll move to the virtual room. Seeing no one here, Charlie, anybody out there? Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I have a, a very brief uh, public comment, and it's regarding the satirical fire department cartoon that ran in the Okina News last week. Um, I personally found it uh, incredibly distasteful. It certainly does not reflect the relationship between um, our fire departments nor our governing bodies. And in my opinion, and it shows a complete lack of uh, respect for the, not only the firefighters, but uh, the elected officials as well. And seeing no one else, we'll move on. And my pen keeps. Thank you. No public hearings. Tonight's consent agenda is relatively long, so bear with me, please. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, a is billed to be allowed in the amount of $153,857.73. B is a budget amendment request to carry over projects for the marina in the amount of $28,000. C is a budget amendment request for a reduction of the major street fund balance in the amount of $75,000. D is a budget amendment request to carry over projects in the major street fund in the amount of $374,000 and in the local street fund in the amount of $233,000. He has a budget amendment request to carry over projects for the public works department within the general fund in the amount of $103,100. After is a budget amendment request to carry over projects in the sewer fund in the amount of $685,000. And G is a Budget amendment request to carry over projects in the IT department within the general fund in the amount of $34,087. And H is a budget amendment request to carry over projects in the water fund in the amount of $172,000. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Mayor Potan Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Mayor Walagora? And Councilwoman Huss. Yes. Thank you. Next up, we have a proclamation this evening. This is a Friends Together proclamation. Whereas in 1996, Friends Together Cancer Support Organization was established in the city of Alpena, supporting families coping with cancer. And whereas in February 1997, the first monthly support group was facilitated by Carrie Rappin at the Alpena County Library as the foundation for the coming nine programs of support throughout Northeast Michigan. And whereas the guiding mission of Friends Together is and has been that no one should experience cancer alone in this six county region, 
And whereas Friends Together has a strong commitment to provide services of support, transportation assistance, and comfort to all persons with cancer ex experience without cost, and whereas Friends Together as an, is an integral part partner with other community organizations supporting health, mental, and emotional needs in our communities, and whereas Friends Together has formed a successful partnership with Alpena Cancer Center of the Mid-Michigan Health System, and whereas Friends Together continues to embrace and comfort our communities with needed resources of advocacy at times of most distress, and whereas Friends Together is celebrating 25 years of community support and appreciation. And now, therefore, I, Matthew J. Walagora, by the virtue of authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Alpena, do hereby proclaim August 8th through August 14th as Friends Together's 25th Celebration Week and congratulate them as they prepare for their dedication and celebration at the Friends Together Center the evening of August 12th. And uh, Judy Burns and her team are here. Oh. Come up here, yes. We'll do that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for what you guys do. I can't believe it's been 25 years. I can't either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have a report of officers. Uh, the first one is a modification of select fees for fiscal year 2022, and our city manager is going to present that. Um, prior to her, I'm going to uh, ask council to accuse me from the topic as it is a request for um, for a reduction in fees, uh, specifically fencing, which is uh, my the business that I'm in. So if we could vote on that first before she starts. Chris, we gotta make a motion. I'm I move oh, to move use the, uh, <laughs> the mayor from the city of this vote. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. 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 And Mayor Pro Tem Jaffa. Yes. Motion carried. Please. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Jaffa is requesting the modification of two fees within the 21 to 22 fee schedule as listed below. One of them is related to the Alpena Regional Trailhead Pavilion to bring that in line with the Start Light Beach Pavilion from um, to $100 refundable deposit and $75 rent. And then number two, the fence permit fee, this fee doubled from 25 to 50, and their request was to modify the fee to 35. The question I have on that, the fence permit fee, how does that align with like, you know, other, other permits that we have within the cost? Are we within the ballpark with the communities? Are we, we, you know, in line now at the $35 fee with, you know, other municipalities around us? I didn't us. check other municipalities. Okay. Um, when I talked to Mayor Fortin Johnson, we just thought pulling it back somewhere in the middle sounded reasonable, okay. but doubling it was just too much for, because these fees have not gone up in a long time. Yeah. And I think some of them were brought up to, you know, where they should be with other mm -hmm. communities. So we thought just a little more step into this one would be mm -hmm. appropriate. Most of the fees, when you, and you know, there's so much to go through in the budget, but most of the fees um, on that level, it was $2.50 or $5. Mm -hmm. Some $10. 
some of the bigger things that like planning commission does some of those double for um, PEDs and all of that but there's a whole lot more work in mm -hmm. those items than there are in um, what what we have to do for a fence permit and doubling that fee when nothing else doubled mm -hmm. and that category seemed a little bit um, excessive yeah it, it did to me as well you know you, you research and you're right you can't really find a lot you find a few here and there but mm -hmm. the ones you can find are much larger communities than ours there wasn't anything that i could find in my research that was comparable to do so but yeah i, I think the fees didn't it go up and i do agree with the mayor pro chem on that too that that one it's a little bit out of the line so i think putting it back in, in line here makes a lot of sense to me as well so i just wanted to understand if you found anything else on that as well so. No other questions, ma'am. Okay. So, do, do we need a motion? Yes. Okay. So, I move that we uh, adjust those two fees um, for the trail bed and the fence permit. Council Manoa? Yes. Councilwoman Hess? Yes. Mayor Portan Johnson? Yes. And Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Next up is the approval of resolution 2021 16 authorization of the city of Alpena to apply for recertification in the redevelopment ready communities program from the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Okay, great. So the redevelopment ready communities RRC program is a no cost program designed by the Michigan Economic Development Corporation to assist local municipalities in establishing a sound foundation for redevelopment and investment to occur in their communities. The program measures and then certifies communities that integrate transparency, predictability, and efficiency into their daily development processes. The city of Alpena was the 19th community to be certified under the statewide RRC program in June of 2018. So we are up for our recertification. And that's every three years. I was just recently notified that now our certification will be good for five years, but we're still on that three-year cycle. So that would um, put us in line with um, five years from now. Um, so here we have before you a, a resolution, also a memorandum of understanding and an action plan. This action plan we worked on um, directly with MADC staff just to meet any of the deficiency or some of the changes that were coming forth in the RRC program over the past three years. So we will, um, the agreement is basically that we will follow through with that action plan and continue to fulfill um, the requirements of the RRC program. So it is my recommendation as city manager and acting planning development and zoning director that city council approve the resolution MOU and action plan, including authorization for Mayor Wellagor to sign the MOU. How many motions is that? <laughs> you know, I would have to ask Bill. I think there may have to be a, two motions, one for the resolution, one for the MOU. But Anybody, does anybody have any questions? No questions. Program. No. I think we've seen benefits in the program. Absolutely. It, it makes us eligible for funding sources that we normally would not be as well. It gives us kind of a, a framework to work within for redevelopment. Okay. So you got the first one there. Okay. So, so you, uh, I'll make a motion um, that uh, we adapt the memo understanding and allow the mayor to sign. I support that. I get the Okay. Just right now. Um, <laughs> Mayor Walgor? Councilwoman Hess? Yes. Mayor Proton Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. And Councilman Noah? Yes. Motion carried. And I move we approve resolution 2021 16.
Councilwoman Hess? Yes. Mayor Potan Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Yowak? Yes. And Mayor Walgora? Right. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, next up is new business is ordinance 21-462 an amendment to the city of alpena zoning ordinance article two three five and seven denise klein is here online uh, mm -hmm. to walk us through that one denise i absolutely um i apologize for not being there i'm having a transportation issue otherwise i would be with you tonight to go through these uh 24 extremely exciting pages of zoning amendments um <laughs> So these initially got started back, I think it was actually like a year ago, I see Don Gilmatz on here, and I think it was last summer that he and I started putting some amendments together um, with the, you know, opening up the zoning ordinance to, uh, to amend it to, to, for the medical marijuana information. We thought it would be a great time to hold all of this, the public hearings and stuff at the same time as, as these zoning minutes, amendments. So you should have a memo from me, and you should also have the the long amendment and I'm just going to kind of walk you through it and then I'm going to stop after each section so if you have questions or if you want to talk about it um, this already went to planning commission they actually re reviewed it at a couple of different meetings and they held a public hearing in the in on July 13th and recommended adoption so if we just start with the I mean I know we're looking at my memo but I'm, I'm I want to go through the actual if you've got the ordinance the amending ordinance open in front of you so the very first section that, that requires some amendments are the definition section. This, these that haven't been amended for a long time and, and it's really needed some work. The adult foster care definitions back when the ordinance was written, I think were pretty basic. And since then, um, I think it's come to light, especially in other communities that we needed some better definitions for the different types of adult foster care facilities that are licensed by the state of Michigan. So. The set of amendments you see under adult foster care, the set of definitions are the definitions that are directly from the Adult Foster Care Licensing Act. So they match up. So we didn't do any tweaking of those. Um, I'm gonna go through the definitions quite quickly because we'll talk a little bit more about adult foster care when we get down to that section in the amending ordinance that amends the actual uh, uses for adult foster care. So I'm gonna skip down to the next page. Uh, which, well, after the adult foster care, which is page three. So we don't have, we use the term in the ordinance, inoperable motor vehicle um, in the zoning ordinance, but we didn't have a definition of inoperable motor vehicle. So this is the definition that you just adopted into your blight ordinance. Just, I think it was last month, you just adopted this. So they match up now. So this is the same text. Um, moving on, your ordinance was written uh, back when the, uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources and, and, and DEQ were, were combined into one department. So it used to say, all through the ordinance it says MDNRE, well that doesn't exist anymore, so we need to get the correct name in there. In most of the ordinance we're actually referring to EGLE because most of your ordinance doesn't refer to the DNR, it refers to EGLE. And then, of course, I added a caveat into the definition of EGLE that says or any subsequently named agency because I don't trust them not to rename that agency again. Um, we needed a couple of tweaks in your definitions for sexually oriented businesses. Uh, I mean, I hate to even have to do this, but we do need it. We use the we use the term human throughout all of those sexually oriented business definitions. And I know you're not seeing the full set of the existing definitions, but if you look in your zoning ordinance, they all hinge on that term human. And in other parts of the country, we are starting to see these types of businesses pop up that don't use humans, that use electronic or robotic devices instead of humans. And we don't want them, you know, going under the radar and not being classified as a sexually oriented business because they technically don't use humans. So we need to put this definition in there under that section that we're also referring to non-living resembling human devices. And then one definition that was just flat out missing from your ordinance, but which is used and which is classified as a sexually oriented business is an escort agency that just for some reason was never defined before. So I wanna add it in there. And then accessory dwelling unit, um, we never had a definition of that. Your ordinance does allow accessory dwelling units, but we called them secondary dwelling units, but we just ne simply never defined them. So we needed to add that definition and then you'll see that we crossed out the word secondary and used the word accessory 
because that is the typical definition or that's the typical phrase that you hear around the country is an accessory dwelling unit. Um, the last set of definitions that we that needed some amendment are the wireless facilities definition. So we added the small cell wireless facility in there because that's something that you need to address because there's a state law that addresses small cell wireless and it's just simply not uh, not addressed in the zoning ordinance. So this is the definition by state law. Again, we didn't tweak it. We're just repeating it from state law. Um, and then the last one is a wireless ground mounted facility because this is a new type of facility that we didn't, well, that didn't really exist when the zoning ordinance was written. In the memo, um, on the page, actually page three of the memo, there's a photo of one of those ground mounted facilities. I think if, if who's ever doing that right there. So it looks like some giant doorknobs. Um, so these are, we, you don't, it doesn't really fall under the definition of a support structure, which is what all of your standards apply to is the, is the towers or so-called support structures. So it doesn't fit under that definition. So it's really hard to tell like, where did, where are these allowed? You know, what are the standards that go with them without some kind of a definition? So we're adding a definition of those. So I'm gonna stop right there before we go on to the actual section and ask if there's anybody that has questions on the definitions. Doesn't sound, no, we're good. Good, I bored you to tears, that's good. Okay, so let's go into the actual, um, the actual text of the zoning ordinance that needs to be amended. So the first one is section, and I got, I'm, I know the, the memo is up on screen, but I'm actually hoping you're following along with the 24 pages of amendments. So section 3.12, which is accessory uses. Um, this language under, uh, actually is on page five of 24. The language in red, you'll recognize because you just adopted it into your blight ordinance as well. So we're just matching it up, just making sure it's covered by zoning. So you've got a couple of different angles that you can go at it, you know, in terms of violations through the zoning, uh, through the zoning ordinance or through the blight ordinance. And Don, you can jump in here anytime you want to add anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's just waving. Okay. So, and then number four, we added that um, if something like that is stored in the front yard in an inoperable vehicle, that there needs to be some kind of cover uh, manufactured for that purpose. Any questions on the accessory uses, the, the inoperable motor vehicle and the demolition derby? I didn't go into it much because you've already talked about this one. Carly, can you scroll down to the section that she's on? She's on two, five of. What's up? Yeah, there it is. If you go to the, yeah. Are you gonna go down? Are you going down further into the document or back up now? Yeah, I'm gonna keep going. We're on page five right now, that one that's up on the screen. So you're on page one of 24. It says it at the bottom if you scroll down a little bit. Yeah. I you promise I won't read them all to you. Thank you, Trim. There we go. Yep, so that's where we're at right now. Okay. Any questions on the car section? No. Nope, we're all set, go ahead. All right, go into section 3.34, and I know Don's gonna jump in on this one. Um, so this was a, a section that we, we never addressed before. So the city has a ordinance already, which is Noxious Vegetation, chapter 102, article three of the Code of Ordinances, which prohibits vegetation over eight inches in height. Um, so this is something that I think, and I'm, I'm going to pick on Don and make him jump in here, that people wanted some ability to have a natural garden in their yard, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. To the point of, uh, severe resistance. <laughs> so planning commission discussed this over a couple of meetings because, you know, it, it's, it's for the providing, you know, an ecosystem for insects and wildlife. They want to do that. Of course, you know, their neighbors don't want the entire yard to be a natural mm -hmm. garden because then, you know, you can attract pests and it looks, you know, kind of messy. So planning commission came up with this language about having, and this is a, this is a, about having 25% of the rear yard as this natural garden. 
And one of the things that that was mentioned at Planning Commission is that, you know, this is something they recommend if we'll try it, try it out. And then we can always change it if it if it's not working or it, it ends up to be problematic. So this is the one I would imagine that there's going to be some discussion over. So I'll throw yeah. it to you. I have, Denise, it's Matt. I, I've got a, just a couple of questions for you and Don um, about this. So, so how do you, so we have several, several places, um, residents in Alpena that, that keep the vast majority of their front yard is like wildflowers and, and you can see that it's, that it's not unmowed grass. It's, it's like a wildflower front yard. How, how will, how will we delineate between um, and a natural garden of unmowed vegetation and a wild flower garden that to some people might look like unmowed vegetation? What's going to be the difference? Well, I, I can answer that. Um, it's going to be just the, the way that we have been doing it. Um, there's, you know, there's a couple of places. There's one on first. There's one over on eighth um there's another one further up on first or second that that's always been their argument you know and then of course there was a, a person that had quite a bit of milkweed in their front and side yards and we've always made some exceptions to that anyway up to the point where we start getting complaints and i mean i be honest with you and i, I think i can speak for the new building official tony dawson you're not going to tell me, I'm not going to look at something and go, oh yeah, that's native to Michigan. I mean, people plan all kinds of things, but we it's based right now on complaints. And then if they're keeping it up, like there's one on the corner of, um, uh, I think it's 4th and Lewis, where the people have had it forever. And it's just, there's some long grasses, there's some flowers, there's a little bit of milkweed. Uh, daisy flowers like you see growing on the side of the road, but they've always kept paths mowed in between it and it's always been kept up. The The problem we ran into that was the reason for putting putting some definitions in the, of a natural garden is because with all the hollow blue of all the pollinators, you know, the, there's not as many bees, there's not as many monarch butterflies, so pe people want to do things to help them. So this is an attempt to allow the people that live in, in the city of Alpena to be able to assist, hopefully with the pollinators, the monarchs, the bees and everything else, and but not become obnoxious to the neighbors or other people in the neighborhood. So like Denise said, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, then we'll go back to the drawing board. But the city has <clears throat> a lot of areas that, I guess it could be said, violate our own ordinance. There's some spots where I noticed and I know I've talked with the city manager about this. There's some areas that people brought to our attention and there where there was quite a few milkweeds. And, you know, I don't know if, if uh, Rachel reached out to DPW or they just decided to try to leave those for the monarch butterflies because they really weren't causing any problems, so to speak. I mean, a lot of people enjoy them. And um, some of them down at the boat harbor when I was harbor master, I actually posted some signs on the, along the wall where there was milkweed growing because the ladies that go down there and help keep it weeded and everything would pull those out because they thought they were weeds, but you know, they let them grow there. So, you know, it's like anything else. We're doing the best we can uh, trying to keep, uh, keep the harmony of what's expected when you live in a, in a city. So th while this one restricts everything to the rear yards, so I know I'm rambling, but you know, you guys are paying me by the hour now, so I'm going to take four of um, <laughs> well, we the and, and I charge from the minute I turn the computer on. But anyway, this, this is going to help. So th there will be a trans transition period where the stuff in the front yard that is seen as being more obnoxious by some people that pass by it, this will allow people a time to start transitioning, transitioning that into the rear yards where most people won't see it. So I, I think, you know, for a first go around, this is a great thing to try out. And, you know, within a year or two, we'll, we'll know how successful we were. Okay. And All right. if, I could, if I could add to that, um, I we've also been looking at Lamar Park because there are, there's huge yeah. hillsides of milkweed. And I've had a couple of um, school-aged children come to visit me about the benefits of that. So we're hoping that 
they're going to use that as a project and, and that we can strike some type of balance with the management of that and how it looks and managing it for um, you know insects and, and pollinators and such. So you hopefully will hear more about that a little bit later in the year, but for now we've um, been trying to manage certain sections of that, but more to come. I, I think this is a, a good balance to start out with. Yeah, and I, and I don't disagree. I just want to be, I just want to go into this one with, with caution, like Don said, and um, just so, you know, the five of us, just so the intent is, the intent is understood from what the five of us might approve and what might, you know, I just want to make sure that us and, and staff and whoever's our ordinance person are all on the same page when we go out, if there's issues in the community that we're all kind of on the same page as far as what we're going to allow and what we don't. So, but it sounds like we are right now. So. Correct. All right, uh, Denise, you're all set. Thanks. All right. So um, if you want to go down to the next page on the screen there, that is where now these uses have started to be added to the permitted and special land use table. I know that's kind of small. Um, for people looking at it but on the screen, but that's okay. You've got the printed copy right in front of you. Um, so the red, obviously, is are the new the the new uses. Not all of them are new. Some of them under the communications. Again, I'm I'm skipping around a little bit because I, I haven't really covered the communications section yet. But the text that was in the table that was listing which districts these things were allowed in did not really match the text that was in the wireless section. So the changes, they're not really changing in terms of where towers and stuff are allowed. It's just, I'm matching it up to the wireless section. So that's why those are in red and you see some strikeouts. Um, the two that are new is the one that says wireless communication facility ground mounted. And then the one at the bottom of the communication section that says small cell wireless facilities. So you'll see that those are listed, the ground mounted are listed in the B3 and the industrial districts, and then small cell wireless facilities, which on my, on my memo that I sent you um, on page three of that memo, you see a, a photo of one, what one looks like. So those are in OS1 uh, commercial corridor, and then B2, B3, and the two I districts. So then if you wanna scroll down just a little bit under human care and social assistance, there's where you're starting to see those adult foster care facility, which were never really addressed before, not just adult foster care, but also adult daycare facilities, which is something that I'm seeing at least in other communities. I don't think there's one in Alpena yet, but in other communities downstate, you're starting to see adult daycare facilities with the aging populations. This is just something that's coming. So um, planning commission, you know, put some in as special uses and some in as permitted uses where they felt they were the most appropriate. Right now, I did look on the state uh, the state website on, on licensing and regulatory affairs. Looks like so far, all of your adult foster care facilities are in the R2 and the RM2 districts in the city, but that doesn't mean that you're not gonna get more requests. I'm seeing actually a lot of them go just outside of town. So more than likely it's gonna be Alpena Township that gets those requests, but I want the city to be prepared. So those are the districts there that the Planning Commission recommended that they be added to. Um, I'm gonna, unless somebody stops me and has a question, I'm just gonna keep have the person keep scrolling down to the next page. Okay, so, all right, so actually this gets really easy for the next several pages because you're just seeing a repeat. Your, your ordinance shows the use tables in two ways. It shows the large one that was on the previous page, but in each district section, it breaks it up by district only. So these small tables are just repeating what you just saw in the large table. So you can actually scroll right past those unless you want to talk about them. This is just so there's the RT and there's your multiple family districts with the facilities allowed. And then we just, again, change the wording for communications in the waterfront and we keep going. This is what, see, this is what took up all the pages. So it wasn't really as long as you thought. Mm -hmm. CBD and CCD, that's the wireless. And then in CCD, you've got some adult foster care and wireless changes. Again, just repeating from the large table. Office, same thing, and then you should have your, yep, all your business districts are all going to say the same thing. 
We're going to get to the good stuff here in just a minute. Yeah, let's keep going till we pass the industrial and then we'll be at the page 13 of 24. See, I'm trying to get through it fast for you. All right, this is an easy one. So this is your 7.32 accessory dwelling unit section. Nothing really changing in content other than the wording that we're using the word accessory dwelling unit or ADU instead of secondary. So um, you can go ahead and scroll down to the next page and that's where the wireless amendments start. All right, so we're getting, we're not so much using the word telecommunications, we're trying to match it up with the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. So we're using the word wireless facilities instead of just towers and antennas because that's just, we're trying to make it consistent with the state. So you'll see that I just changed over all of those words to wireless. If you scroll down to the next page, again, no real changes other than the word wireless is being put in there. It's not until you get to page 16 of 24, so I think it's probably the next page, that you start getting into content changes. Okay, so this is where um, there's a specific approval process for wireless communications facilities that it's part of the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. And your ordinance just didn't spell out that approval process. Doesn't matter, you still have to abide by the approval process in state law. But now we have it spelled out. So who is ever the zoning administrator can see that, oh, this is the process we go through. The state actually um, puts a, a time limit on how long you have to approve those types of facilities. So for example, like number two, you know, I'm mean, sorry, number one, when an application comes in, the zoning administrator has 14 days to determine if that application is complete. So if they, if the city misses any of those deadlines, it's sort of one of these automatic approvals. Okay, so we don't want to miss these deadlines. So that's why I wanted them spelled out in the ordinance. Um, if you keep scrolling down, again, I'm not, we're not, you know, I'm not going to read it to you. Or we'd, we'd be here till 10 o'clock, right? So um, basically, so you can stop right there. You have essentially 90 days to get the um, to get the application through the process and either approve or deny the application. So if it doesn't meet that, then it's automatically approved, but that's never gonna happen. So I just wanted it listed in there. So, and then if you keep scrolling on to page 17, not a whole lot of changes in development standards, okay? The, what we really needed though, is we needed to address right there in red, that ground mounted facility. So if one of those comes into the city, we needed to have some kind of recommendation for setback or not, not a recommendation, a standard for setback. One of these actually is in Hillman right now and they did not have this in their ordinance. They weren't because, you know, no one knew these things even existed. So um, Hillman actually did a little bit of research and I worked with Hillman and discovered that there's 175 foot you know, recommended setback from um, other properties for these facilities. So we wanted to make sure to put that in there. Denise, and that's where does that, I'm sorry, but before you move on, where does yeah. that 175 feet recommendation come from? That comes from the FCC. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's actually, I'm not sure if there's meets that, but that's why they, they wanted to know because when that went up in Hillman, you know, the signs on the, the fence around it or something says, like danger radiation, right? And so when you have a danger radiation sign, that's when all the neighbors go, wait, wait, what's this mean? Is this dangerous? So they started getting tons of phone calls into the village offices. And that's when they started actually talking to the, the company that put it in and then also the um, FCC to make sure that they were in compliance with their recommendations and regulations that they have, so. Okay, so that, I think if you keep scrolling, that's the only one on that page. And then I don't think there are any amendments until you, and this, so I just, I, re, I just put the whole section in here so you could see the whole wireless section together and how it all fits together. So then it isn't until you get down to page, it looks like 22 of 24. Okay, so, oh, keep going, see that? Okay, there we go. So that is a section on the small cell wireless facilities. Again, in your memo, there's a photo of one of these. So these are all regulated under Public Act 365. Um, so small cell facilities that are in the public right of way are exempt from zoning, so it doesn't even come through the zoning ordinance. But if they are not in the public right of way, 
you know, there's so there's a, a segment of them that are not exempt from zoning. So the state law, Public Act 365 of 2018, actually explains how the approval goes for these small cells. So now that they're in your ordinance, so again, the ones that are in that table that lists the districts these are allowed in, those are the non-exempt uh, small cell facilities. So the vast majority of them are exempt because the vast majority are going in the public right of way. But we want to be prepared for if somebody wants to put one up that's not in the public right of way, designated as a special land use. Again, the state law says you have so many days you know, to review the application for sale. Now, why couldn't they do it the same as towers? Why couldn't they have the same number of days? No, that would make it too easy. This one is 30 days. So you've got 30 days to review the application. And then if you keep scrolling down, um, you've got a essentially 150 days. For brand new facilities, you've got 150 days for a new facility on a new support structure. So then if you keep going on to page 23, the state, again, this is all from state law, so you don't have a lot of wiggle room in it. It actually says, you know, you've got to, if you deny it, you've got to have evidence. Um, you've got to, you know, you have got to have a reasonable basis for that denial. Um, you can't discriminate against the applicant with replace, you know, in terms of placement of other facilities of other wireless providers. So these are the standards that you have to go by. Again, you don't have a lot of wiggle room because it's 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 dictated to you by state law. So if you keep scrolling, let's see, is there anything? Nothing really that you can <laughs> that you can change. Um, single use towers. So these are this is exempted um, by the Code of Federal Regulations 47. So these are single, so a single use tower is, let's say I'm, I have to put something up in order to get some reception. So these are, again, by federal law, exempted from your, the regulations of this section because you need to be able to get an antenna up in the air to receive a signal. Now, it becomes not exempt if you decide that you wanna transmit that signal. Now, so you've got another property or something, you wanna bounce that signal off your antenna to somebody else's, then it's no longer exempt. It's not a single use tower. So that's just some language that your ordinance was missing just to clear everything up. And then is that it? We made it to the end, I think that's it. The rest of it is just the amending ordinance uh, legal language. Any questions? I know that was exciting. <laughs> I don't have any, does anyone have any? No, you covered it very well. Um, really appreciate it, uh, both you and Don. No. Questions at all. So then we would want to bring this back for the first reading if everyone agrees on this language for the ordinance, um, or excuse me, for the first reading at the next council meeting. Okay. So this isn't the first, this can't qualify as the first reading. We wanted to get it to you because there's a lot of information there. Oh, okay. Give you a chance to digest it. So that's fine. If you do have any suggested changes, we do that at the first reading. Okay. Second reading for approval. All right. Sounds good. So we don't even need to receive file or anything. No, we're just going back on for okay. next meeting. We can table it then. Too much sun today. All right. So we'll move on from that one. Thank you so much, Denise and Don. Appreciate it. And Planning Commission. Thanks. Okay, next up on the agenda is a recreational marijuana topic. And Amber Kess is lead us off on that one, I believe. Um, yes, I just I wanted to, to bring the topic up. It's something that we discussed that um, we discussed medical marijuana for quite a few years and it was kind of a wait and see, and then we have established guidelines for that. And so I think it's a topic that needs to be addressed. I think um, citizens deserve to know where the council stands on it. And quite a few communities around the state have moved forward. Um, with recreational facilities and Councilman the Mitchell found a call to get some feedback from citizens and um, one citizen sent a letter to all of us. I just want to just read a couple of sentences from this because it kind of succinctly kind of gives the idea of how I feel and the citizen said I don't use marijuana, I don't really plan to, um, but in his words, I feel the city is limiting itself and maybe even hurting itself by not wanting legal dispensary. This is an item approved by the majority of Michigan voters, so blocking or limiting it because of old beliefs or prejudice is wrong. The city can make money off of it and apply those funds to city improvements that have been pushed back through the budget. That was part of the letter, and, and it, those are some 
some points that I think are very valid. I also like to add that not only did the majority of Michigan, the state of Michigan voters approve recreational marijuana uh, moving forward, the majority of Alpena city voters approved it as well. Um, and so to send people out of our community to spend money on a legal substance, um, we have, we know that Rogers Township is north of us and Harrisville is south of us, there are recreational marijuana facilities. And so to ask people to go out of our community to send money on something that is their legal choice to purchase and use. And also limits have businesses that may come here to be more jobs. And there is money to be made off of recreational marijuana. It's not the only reason to do it, of course, but if there are funds to be had and it could make city improvements. I don't see why it doesn't make sense to capture those rather than send those dollars that people are going to spend anyway out of our community. And I also lastly, and I've said this in the beginning, I don't think it's our place to, to try to even regulate the recreational choices or options of our residents. So those are just some thoughts I wanted to bring up about this and just get the conversation going. Again, um, most of you know and I, and that I am not running again for office. I will um, I move out of the city in the next few months, so I will no longer uh, be eligible to be in city council. So I won't be here to see this moving forward, but I wanted to bring the topic back up because I think it is still timely and it's something on people's minds. And um, as the next people run for council, it's important to know where they stand on it. So those are my thoughts. All right. Thanks, Amber. You um, make a lot of good points. Um, and of course, I've uh, responded to uh, the media a few times and different residents about the fact that, yeah, we, we will in fact be, this will come up as a topic of discussion. And I always just use the term in the future um, because I never know or knew, you know, when we would bring this back up. So um, now is fine. Um, I want to, um, I guess, get a feel for perhaps it's without a, um, uh, there hasn't been a, um, uh, motion of any kind. So, so right now, it's just, this is just a topic of discussion unless someone does make a motion. But uh, so for now, I guess, are you just kind of asking for a, to see where everyone is at? With I it, guess, uh, to see where everyone's at, but if there's any indication that there's even half the council that's of interest, and like I said, the next person maybe along in a few months, we don't know where they'll stand. Um, I think that the um, idea of having maybe not a motion, but even just directing staff to look at how, if it was something council wanted to do in the future, wanted to move forward with, how we take the recreational, or excuse me, the medicinal ordinances we have and how that could perhaps translate into recreational ordinance. I know there are some differences um, in the, the laws, but just to have that information to move forward for information. Yeah. So I guess there'll be more direction than emotion at this point that we would like to guess see where one else stands on there again. And um and of course there was the another another point that's been made I guess by by us up here in time was is we always we say well we're we're in a wait and see. I often tell people we're in a wait and see um period because it was brought up at council. I think those were the exact words is that we would wait and see. So I would be interested in um I'd be interested in what, uh, maybe an update on what the current ordinances would be. What's the, because it's been a while. As a matter of fact, I think Adam was here back when we discussed this before, so I don't know what's changed. Um, just an idea of what um, what city council is allowed and, and allowed to and not allowed to. I'm, I'm very well versed in medical marijuana, unfortunately, because I just studied it so hard because we had so many different choices we could make. Um, ha, not like, you know, yeah, so, yeah, you understand. Uh, yeah, we all are. <laughs> yeah, and so it, um, just because we had so much latitude as far as the five different facilities and things of that nature where recreational mar uh, marijuana is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe perhaps just an update on, on what our abilities are. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would suggest. Uh, and uh, I don't, I'd also, um, part of our wait and see was also what, what other communities were going to do. Um, what our what our neighbors were going to do, and now that they have, it almost seems like uh, like Amber pointed out that um, almost all of our neighbors have done have done something, um, and and in the pro pro uh, direction, of course we have Roger City, uh, Harrisville, um, Ascoda, um, Tawas, 
and so perhaps on a couple of different levels, maybe 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 Rachel could reach out uh, to some of those governments and see what their issue, if they've had any issues. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps law enforcement um, and the fire department chiefs might kind of do the same. Uh, their counterparts in those communities just to find out if if, if we have um, if some of the fears that have been brought up if those communities are seeing those in reality uh, because it, some of them have been quite some time Roger City's been right almost from the first day that they were allowed and uh, Harrisville has been a little bit more recent uh, just months I think uh, Kawas and Oscoda uh, quite some time now so I think they would be able to provide some data for us if you guys think that I was thinking of the fact that uh, there probably has to be an inclusion to the marijuana ordinance for personal use recreation uh, or because there's different laws governing the personal use versus the medical marijuana itself. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Um, two such things as uh, can they open up a separate business just for personal use? And um, the only thing I had seen at the time was it was cohabitating that a medical marijuana provisioning center, but it had to have a separate point of sale. Okay, in other words, you have a cash register on this side, but you can't ring up personal use on that cash register if it's medical marijuana. And that's in the law. Um, same thing for uh, um, no, shall we say, testing on site and you know, using it on site kind of things. But it really comes about to what um, we may have to change in the ordinance to, to cover them. So before we uh, we need to find out what we have to have in an ordinance or an act on that, I think we have to have a separate. Right. Yeah, that, would be a, that would be a great update. Uh, um, update. I, I know where she's coming from, and I've read a lot of uh, emails uh, that uh, I asked the people to, to uh, send me just to get information. Um, I have personal reasons why I don't like marijuana, but I cannot use those personal reasons when it comes to the citizens of Alpena. Um, so that's the reason I asked them to please talk to me about what they they felt like this, and uh, I would represent the people that uh, I was supposed to do. So I just want to make sure that we get, don't put the cart before the horse, let's get the horse out there first, and do the ordinances and stuff like this. Yeah. And, you know, and yeah, and first of all, let me thank Council for postponing this, uh, tabling, postponing it. You know, I really appreciate that. Uh, it is because you know, ever since we passed the medical marijuana, I have been you know doing what Danny has done is talking to a lot of different people, and really have sought out opinions that are far different than mine. Okay, uh, the reason being is because you know. What Amber had brought up is yes, it did pass. It passed by, and I don't have the exact number, but I believe it was 172 votes. So it's a 50 50 issue within our city. Okay, but it did pass. Now, my personal take on that is there's, there's a large group of citizens that are opposed, there's a large group of citizens that are for, okay, and then there's a bunch of people in the middle that are waiting and seeing. They're, they're fine with us opening up our medical marijuana facilities, but they want to understand exactly, you know, what issues we're going to run into and, and what we're going to see going forward. You know, and that's not a matter of months. It could be a matter of a year or two, you know, just to see what there are. Plus, I think we have some advantages that there are other facilities in, in neighboring communities where we could reach out to you and say, what are we seeing? You know, early on, one of the things that I did is I contacted representatives in both Portland and Colorado Springs just to get a take on that. And the one that stood out in my mind, it says, go slow and go steady because you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And in the state of Colorado, what they were telling me is the same in Michigan here, is that if a council fails to act on recreational within their community, the voters can actually put it back on the ballot and, and say, we want recreational facilities. That's their course. They can they can actually have a facility if they vote on it. If we don't have any action. But if we put in a facility, there's no recourse for those that didn't want that. So that's the reason that they were giving me the go, go slow and just see how things turn out. So I agree with the mayor and the fact that, you know, looking into it and saying, hey, what would we have to do if we want to go that route is never a bad thing because it helps us educate ourselves and get additional opinions from the public on 
on where we need, need to go in the next steps. I don't think that's a bad next step. Um, I certainly am not going to be of the, the part of like, let's rush into it. It's like, hey, yeah, we got medical. We don't even have a facility up yet, but let's just jump right in. You know, it's like, I'm, that's just not what the feedback I'm getting. And that's not what I think would be the best course of action, you know, for us. But I do believe that we have to continue the education and continue to look at what we need to do going forward and be prepared when we get to that point. You know, I, you know, my, my opinion is, is that it is going to be a majority that may eventually have it in the city of Alpena here, just based on those that are the wait and sees, you know, and saying, hey, we're not having any issues in here. Let's maybe look at that a little bit closer. So, so I think slow and steady is going to be, you know, a course of action that we should take. You know, that's just my opinion, and, and it's based on, as you know, where I was at the beginning and where you know, everybody I talked to. The other thing too is this is just something on, on council is what happens a lot I've noticed over the years that I've served is that when people feel you're a certain way on an, any kind of opinion of something, those people will always bring come to you because they feel they're connected to you. Like, oh, I'm glad that you didn't do that because that's where I was. It's a lot of extra work, but worth the work in going deeper to the people that are seeing it in the opposite of you and you get a better take on where your citizenship is. So I'm just putting that out there because it's, it's really worked well for me at least the last 18 months or so. So that's all I have to say. And again, I appreciate council postponing so I could be part of that discussion. I make a comment. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you recall, but back in March, uh, the state put out what the recreational marijuana payments were to um, to municipalities, and uh, based on marijuana revenues collected in fiscal year 20, each license paid 28,000. It's not like it's well, in my opinion, you know, it's not hundreds of thousands of dollars that we'd be getting. It's 28,000. So. Just take that for what it's worth. So, on that note, and then I've got a quick question for Michael. But um, so, on that note, it's it's twenty eight thousand dollars per license. Yep. Um, so, so part of my thought has been is that if 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 the direction we're going to go is eventually going to be allowing re recreational marijuana sales every every year that we don't allow it we're out $28,000 per license. So if we see it coming and we know it's coming, then then I wanna, I will, you know, that's partially why, you know, irrelevant to other topics, but or points, that's one of the reasons why I'd like to kind of move it, move it ahead. If, we, if we're gonna get there anyhow, and we see it and we know that we're gonna get there, then, then the, we're, we're, we're not losing revenue because it's not costing us anything, but we're not gaining revenue that we could gain if, if we knew it was going to come. So it's just been a thought. It's been on my mind. Um, can can I, I ask a question on that? Yeah. What are the costs of the $28,000 that, that, that are in? Do we have any information on what are additional costs is each license going to cost the community? Because in Colorado Springs, they don't have a facility within, within Colorado Springs, but the facilities surround it. But the cost for law enforcement uh, for marijuana related, what they call crime, and I'm just, you know, talking for that area, uh, they, they've gone up and they couldn't even put an exact number on it, but they just knew that those those costs for crime and law enforcement have gone up from, you know, I guess inspection of facilities to, you know, all the additional uh, driving under the influence or, you know, driving under whatever it was. I mean, it, there was nothing specific that I can recall. But what they call this cost, and I'm thinking, is there a way for us to, you know, say, okay, what do we project the future of those costs? Because we can say if it's twenty-eight thousand dollars in revenue. That revenue is not going to be one hundred percent revenue. We know there's going to be additional cost, or we know we feel there's going to be additional cost, but we don't have any way to, you know, exactly put that on there. And I mean, you know, yeah, but they do, and they're living with it, and we've got time to sit there and and say it's not just about the revenue that's coming in, we have to examine the whole part of the equation, which is the cost and what other facilities, you know, are going to, you know, whatever municipalities, whatever issues they're going to have, yeah. if there are some. Yeah, and I'd agree with that to a certain extent that there's a there's there's somewhat of a cost. Some of them are covered by, some of those costs like inspections and things are, are covered by the fees that they have to pay. Um, 
but at the same time, we kind of got to look at the fact, or I look at the fact that it's it's not only is it available 30 miles from here, mm -hmm. but it's also available at my front door because I can order it and have it delivered. Mm -hmm. So, so how much more do you, how much more use do you think that would actually be if it was if it, if, it, if you're going to go keep money local and pay it, pay somebody here locally than you would if you're just going to drive 28 to 30 miles and get it in. So how much more use and how much more crime and how much more cost is there? It's probably not answerable. I, I would challenge anybody to answer me because I don't, I don't think there's an answer. There's just no math for that. But, but the argument would be is that, okay, now we've waited and seen and it's that close to us. So it, it's not like, it's not like it was, Less than five years ago, um, so it's already readily available. It's, it's here. Yeah, it's just a matter of just so those are you know those are just things to to consider. What I wanted to ask you before I forget um, mm -hmm. is that when you're and and I think Danny's used the phrase before, so I just want to clarify or I'd like to have clarification exactly what do you mean when you say you can't put the genie back in the bottle? Oh. What what's the genie? The genie is once you add the facilities into your community to sell recreational marijuana. That, that business can't be taken away. Oh, I understand that. that. That's what they were referring to when they said they couldn't put the genie in the bottle. Like they allowed the facilities within their community and then they saw what issues were popping up and then they couldn't say, okay, let's get rid of all the facilities. Maybe that helped that. I mean, there's one study that I have not been able to find, but I've heard of, and you know, it could be, it's just like, you know, <laughs> use among the youth in both marijuana and how, how come they accelerated when the facilities were added into the communities. I mean, I don't have information on that, but I know that, I mean, there's some out there that I'd like to find a little bit more, not internet related, but if we can find some of those, you know, so that's what they were referring to is like, you know, the genie being a marijuana facility. Once we add those into our community and if they don't cause any issues, fantastic. But what if they do? I mean, in, I mean, we can't do everything on what ifs and buts, but. Okay, so you're, you're going by the fact yeah. that you can't. We, yeah, we, we know that. We couldn't take the, yes, from the ordinance, we can't so take that. So like the genie is just the facility yep. itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. The and, and licenses. The licenses, yeah. 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 And licenses. that's, I guess that's kind of exactly why I asked if we could get some local data, because mm -hmm. I, I could, any one of us could sit here on the internet and find oh, as yeah, much exactly. as you want, pro exactly. and con and data. It, it's insane that yeah. the data doesn't for everything you can find pro i can find again so I, i'd like to i'd like to find you can um you know something sorry i had that up for my camera <laughs> <laughs> um something more on a local level with our neighbors yeah as far as what they've seen rather than doing research on the internet also i have a question for you know that number did you say if that was an average because i'm just going to why I'm asking specifically because I've heard um, on the radio but they've researched the local area um, in the Rogers Township and it was reported that in the one year of operation they had, that the community had made I believe in tax revenue 50 it was over 50 or 68 thousand dollars that one very small facility and then I just heard on the radio this week that Kalkaska they've added some more licenses and they're talking about how many they're going to have in their community um total soon but they said that each facility was generating 80 some thousand dollars in revenue for each license for the community so i guess i'd like to just know a little more where that number came from and, yeah. and why it doesn't and i'm sure that uh, it said that on whatever so you're looking at i'm curious to know if what mm -hmm. riders township would say or you know would say last year because it's on their books um because it said the, the news stories were reporting much larger number than that for the facility was a part of that information, Jim, for example, of the licensing fee and six, uh, six percent sales tax, but not just like revenue sharing. We don't get all that six percent sales tax that was generated in the city. We get a proportional share back. So uh, the numbers that I kept seeing on uh, this was up to twenty eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars per license. So that's where I was seeing that. I saw no numbers even in the highest generating area like this because actually the, the county got more than the city got and the state got a large amount of it's like this so um, 
really have to look at what the numbers are going in there. Yeah, and I found that kind of funny when I read that. And just take your time. You don't have to do it now because we'd really like to. I think what we're asking is maybe you specifically reach out to the treasurers of those communities and find out what how, how that works and what what they've been able to. Well, um, this report, it says that there was $9.9 .9 million in revenue um, and there was 178 licenses. So when I multiply or divide that, it's um, $56,000. $56, so I'm not sure who gets half of that. So if you divide that by two, then you get I the can answer that. If you Oh, there's a little piece. Piece. <laughs> Can I answer that? Yeah, yeah, please, please. So the reason that that number is the, the same payment that's given to like, for example, Rogers Township, that 28,000 is an equal payment given to Preskill County. So that's where that 56 is coming from. So the community does oh, okay. that. So from the money goes to the city budget, from the county. And that, so you're, so what you're, what you both are saying is that is that it doesn't matter that's a that's a mission that's the state of michigan so mm -hmm. per license that community yep. the, the county gets half of 56 and the and the community whether it's township or the city gets the other half yep and that's a standard fee per license there's nothing nothing so it's a percentage though of the revenue i believe so is it a percentage of revenue or is that just a standard number Everybody's so I'm looking at the report that the state put out, and everybody's getting per license twenty eight thousand and one dollar thirty two cents this year. But I'm saying if, if the revenue was twelve million next year instead of nine million, it would be higher. Oh, okay. So you see, that's what I don't know. So so it's based on it's based on all the revenue that's that's revenued in the state. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. Um, so it's based on all of the annual revenue in the state. So if the one in Rogers makes way more than the one in Alcona, it doesn't matter because it's all just made into a pie and then split. But even if the revenue does go up, there's also going to be more licenses issued. Yeah. Right. So it's still. Yeah. So it'll just keep, but it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter what their individual revenue is, what individual stores revenue is. It's the pie. That gets part of the fun. So if we had one in the city of Alpena, the county would get twenty-eight thousand. We would get twenty-eight. Would have last year. Numbers. Would right. Would have last year, but right. next year's and the, every year it could be completely different based on number of facilities and how much sitting. Gotcha. Got that. I think the projected uh, funding much higher position yeah. apparently because there's more shops open right across the state so um <clears throat> don't know what that's going to translate to for a shop but it's anticipated that will be that'll be higher than it was last year even with the increased number of stores even the increased licenses I mean, the sales are increasing and they're increasing mainly on the recreation side Medical marijuana is kind of steady. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that had cards have not gotten cards because you can never get a recreation. You don't need to sign up to get card. Yeah, which is why there's probably way more advertisements on the radio for getting a medical marijuana card because there never there was there hasn't been in years, and now all of a sudden you, you listen to the radio for an hour and you're going to hear the ad and they're pushing for people to get to get them um so that, so that don't, somebody somebody in that field is stagnated if you will so. i appreciate everyone's willingness to gather information look at the information and mm -hmm. yeah. we so, know how long the last conversation took <laughs> several well, years so it started now seems like it's a good thing yeah, so if no one's opposed to, to Rachel and her staff kind of answering some of these questions, bringing something back, bringing some data back. I do have one more piece of information. Um, Councilman Noah, Noah kept asked me um, earlier today where we're at on the medical marijuana facilities. Mm -hmm. And so we know that um, you know, the weekend of this company has come in with building 
plans and we were waiting for one more piece of information from them this week and they should be able to be issued a building permit. We have not officially heard anything from Green Buddha. I know there are some rumors out there, um, but we, we don't have anything official from them. So that's where we are. Those were um, approved at the planning commission level on January 12th, so they were on January 12th. So they would have a year from that date. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I move we adjourn to closed session to update uh, proposed, proposed litigation with the Alpina Prototype Bio Refinery American Process Incorporated in Grand Bio LLC. If you do that, I'm going to make it repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Yes. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. And Councilwoman Hunt? Yes. Motion three. All right. Just a quick note to anyone in the, on virtual. Um, we, uh, we, we have possible action um, after closed session, but uh, even in the event that we do, uh, we will prepare a, a, a press okay. release for, for them. Yes. Yeah, it'd probably be easier at this point than they have had. Bill Piper okay. with any questions. Yeah, if you have any questions after that, if you contact Bill Piper, um, uh, he'll be able to I'll answer that. that but other, otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. you, your choice to stay online is it's fine to come back uh, to open session. And we're good. And you recognize buildings and having a new haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Got it? Says we're unmuted. Okay. Okay. Back in open session. All right. Um, I move that we approve the forbearance agreement with DPI pending their signature. Second. Third. Third. Councilman Mitchell? Yes. Councilman Noah? Yes. Mayor Walagora? Aye. Councilwoman Huss? Yes. And Mayor Potom Johnson? Yes. Motion for you. And um, I see that there might be a couple of uh, media outlets on the on the virtual call, if you're still on there, uh, the city manager is going to send a, a brief press release and um, pertaining to what we just uh, discussed and approved. And if, uh, again, if you have any questions beyond what you read in the email, uh, contact uh, our attorney, Bill Piper. Well, does that need to be a second? So, okay, a second. <laughs> Did we change that? Did we change?